Well, thank you for being in worship this day, wherever you might be. Uh, and today we're going to be starting a new sermon series called Joyful. Uh, and we're going to be taking a look over the next few weeks at the book of Philippians, which is one of the most beloved books in the New Testament, certainly in the Bible, really. And it's a really a, a, a book that focuses on Paul's understanding of joy and how he lived it in his life. And so how that would apply to us as well. Uh, I also want to lift up that, yes, the pumpkins are here. Yes, I am sore from them loading all those pumpkins yesterday. Uh, and uh, we're looking for pumpkin patch volunteers, people to come down and work uh, and uh, to be here for uh, sales of the pumpkins over the next few weeks. So if you're interested in doing that, just contact the church office or contact Pastor Charlotte and they will get you signed up with that. And we really wanna encourage you to do that. Also today is communion, first Sunday of the month. And if you're gonna be taking communion online, I wanna encourage you to get your elements ready for communion here later on in this service. Uh, and I just also wanted to announce that uh, the administrative council here at Good Shepherd, uh, after considering it a couple of days ago, has decided to go back to masks optional uh, in our services and in our meetings. Uh, and so if you wanna wear a mask uh, as you come into worship or into other situations here in the church, feel free, of course, to do that. And if you don't, that's up to you as well. You can choose that option as well, but masks are optional now at Good Shepherd. Before we begin, though, let us pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your grace and goodness towards us in this day. We give you thanks for your, your love that is always present in our lives. Help us as we go over this next few weeks. Help us to move more fully into a joy-filled life in Jesus. For we ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, thank you for being in worship as we continue, actually begin, I should say, a new sermon series, Joyful, and really talking about a, a generous and content life that's offered to us in Jesus. And as I was getting ready for this particular sermon this day, which really is about the first chapter of, or sections of the first chapter of uh, Paul's letter to Philippians, uh, I was reading the Wall Street Journal, 
and I came across this uh, particular article. I was kind of interested in it because my family, over the years, we'd operated and owned several restaurants. And, and so really we operated and owned them in part because, well, there's just a joy in serving people uh, and in blessing people and seeing them enjoy good food and what have you. Uh, and it was an article about restaurants and the service industry. And, and it talked about how the service industry was running into a problem that they hadn't had in the past, restaurants. Uh, and the problem was that an increasing number of people were, they were acting out, they were acting aggressively towards the staff, they were throwing tantrums there in the middle of the restaurant and what have you. Uh, and, and back in the past, it used to be the customer was always right, but these restaurateurs, they decided that really we kind of got to back off of that customer is always right thing uh, and go to some other uh, reason, because, some other way of thinking about this because as one of them said, our staff in the last year and a half has been uh, through hell and back because of the COVID problems and all the things that were going on. Uh, and so one of them decided that what they would do is they put at the front of the restaurant, there at the entrance, a big sign and it says, be kind or leave. Uh, and the idea was, look, you want to come in and you want to be part of our, uh, you know, restaurant family here and, and whatever, but that's fine. But if you start acting out, you're going to be exiting. Uh, and, you know, the reason why they said that was because, well, well, the way that people had been acting recently had taken the joy out of serving others. And I think a lot of times that's the way we look at joy. We think of joy as really being kind of conditional, you know, uh, to be joyful in life. This particular situation has to be the case, or I have to have this car, or I have to have this house, or this possession, or be in a relationship with this person or that person, or have this particular position, or status, or job, or things like that. Uh, and if I have those things, then I'll be joyful. But the truth is that joy is a choice. Joy is a byproduct of how we think and act according to the way that God's Spirit is leading us to. And as we think and act according to the way that the Spirit is leading us, then we uh, have the choice to move into joy in our lives. Now, I understand that in our lives, there are kind of common barriers that we have to deal with. Uh, for instance, pain, uh, you know, it's simply acute pain, but I think probably worse is long-term kind of chronic pain uh, that people can kind of get into at times. Uh, you know, maybe it's physical pain, maybe it's emotional pain, or sometimes it's just other people, picky people in your life that are really kind of have, causing you problems, or sometimes it's just stress. In fact, here in a few weeks, I'm going to be talking about how to de-stress your life uh, and then our difficulties or problems that we might have to deal with. Now, that gets me to what Paul was going to as he was writing this letter to the, the Christians at Philippi. Philippi was a part of uh, uh, Greece. Uh, he was part of the Roman Empire at that point. Uh, and he's writing to the Christian, the, G the Jesus followers at Philippi. And Paul has every reason to be bitter. I mean, he is in prison. Uh, he uh, is there in Rome. He's away from his family. He's away from his friends. Uh, he's probably going to be executed. Uh, and really for nothing that he did, it was just for an uproar that was caused by some other people. And he, what, did he, what did he do? He decided to write basically one of the more beloved books of the Bible, Philippians. And it's a book on joy. And in this particular passage we're going to look at today, it's, you know, how do you handle the kill joys of life? And how do you be joyful in spite of the circumstances that you might be in so that you have joy no matter what? Now, uh, the key verse that I want to take a look at that in this first chapter is uh, Philippians 1.27 where he says, Whatever happens, he says to these Philippians, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. And again, here's Paul, he's in prison, he's in Rome, he's probably going to be executed, and he's writing to these people, and he's saying, now here's how you stay joyful, no matter what, and he lists up several really important things about how to consider when we deal with those problems in our lives, or the struggles or difficulties in our lives. Now, the first one I wanted to lift up was, he basically his teaches, look at my problems from God's point of view, from God's point of view. You see, joyful people have a larger perspective on things. They look up uh, when they're having problems. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, I was in a seminar with, a, uh, there was a neuropsychologist that was speaking, and he told me, and he told the people who were there, I, I didn't realize this, but he said, we we're kind of hardwired uh, in our brain, literally, where that if we will just look up, uh, it will tend to make us feel better. And he, he was a Christian believer as well. And he says, when we look up and we pray to God and we reach out to God, it says, it will change the way that you're looking at your life. It will change how you're feeling. And so, see, the problem is when we don't see from God's point of view, we get discouraged, we get frustrated, we become joyless. Uh, and Paul is trying to teach us, no, 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 there's a different way. And Paul is saying, no matter what, 
God can use those good times and those bad times uh, in order to bless us, but we have to look at our problems from God's point of view. Now look at what uh, Philippians 1.12 says there. He writes this, I, don't, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me, and there was a lot of bad stuff that had happened to him, has helped to spread the gospel, the good news. Now, uh, you know, as I was thinking about that particular quote, I was, I was, uh, I was driving over there at the Capitol area with my wife. Uh, we went down uh, to one morning to get some tacos at Big Truck Tacos there on 23rd. Uh, and, uh, you know, okay, so we drove through. We got the tacos. Where are you going to eat? Well, let's go up to the Capitol building. And we drove up to the Capitol building. This was last weekend. And we didn't think, oh, wait a second. Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, is going to be up there. They're going to be doing a, a, you know, a, a gathering there. And so we drove by the Capitol building. And just on the south lawn there, they had, some, they had some trucks there. They had stuff that they were bringing in. They had lights. They had all kinds of stuff. Uh, and Franklin Graham was going to be there. And he was going to be teaching to a crowd. Uh, and, you know, I'm just looking at this. And I'm thinking, that's what Paul was probably thinking about when he was thinking about going to Rome. Uh, now, in different books that he writes, in different letters that he writes, he says, my plan is I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to bring this offering for the poor that the churches in other areas had gotten up for Jerusalem's poor. Uh, and then after I do that, I'm going to go to Rome. And then when I, when I finish at Rome, I'm going to go to Spain. And his in, in kind of in idea was go to Spain and, speak, and preach the gospel there. Uh, and so he goes to Jerusalem thinking that's the next step. That's his plan. And he finds out, guess what? That may be my plan. That may be Paul's aspiration, but that's not God's plan. And what happens is he ends up a prisoner and he's in uh, kind of that in Judea there for a couple of years as a prisoner. And then he's sent uh, by, to Rome where he has appealed to Caesar since he's a Roman citizen. And they're going to take him before Caesar to appeal his case before Caesar. And he ends up as a prisoner at Rome. Uh, and, you know, he's thinking, man, I'll go to Rome and I'll be there and I'll be free. And I'll, you know, and I'll get to the public square and I'll start preaching and teaching the gospel. And people will hear it and there'll be new believers. And he ends up, no, no, that's not what's going on going, Paul. You're going to be in prison in Rome. But you're going to be in prison in Caesar's imperial compound. And, you know, he's in there, and there was like Roman guards that were chained to him for 24 hours a day. But the thing about it was he got to talk to all kinds of key people there in, prisoners, in, uh, in Caesar's kind of imperial compound. And the results of it were something that he would never even imagine could have happened. Because in two years, some of even Caesar's would be Caesar Nero. Uh, his own household became believers. And the other result was kind of unexpected. Paul had to stop. He couldn't be running around all over the Mediterranean, going from church to church and town to town. And so he ends up writing a big part of the New Testament there too. So it ends up actually God's plan was better than his plan. Now, I want you to supply that. And I want you to think about a problem that you're having, a struggle that you're having in your life. And just get that in, in focus. And then I, I want to ask you right now, just if you would, just to, Close your eyes, and I want you to pray this prayer with me as you're thinking about that problem. And just want to invite you to pray this prayer. God, help me to see this prayer from your perspective. Help me to see this prayer, this, this problem, from the eyes of faith. Help me to see this problem from the eyes of faith. Amen. Now, look, when we face our problems with faith... Uh, things happen just like it happened in Paul's life. And what happened with Paul was it affected other people when he faced this, this problem with faith that he was dealing with of being in prison there in Rome. The first thing was, and you see this quote from, first, uh, uh, from Philippians 1.13, uh, for everyone here, he says, including the soldiers in the palace guard. Now that would be hundreds, thousands of soldiers knows that I am in chains because of Christ. In other words, the message of Christ has gotten to hundreds, maybe thousands of soldiers there in that imperial compound. Uh, so that non-believers all of a sudden are affected by what he's going through and how he's weathering it. And the second thing is, you'll see there, and because of my imprisonment, many of the Christians here have gained confidence and become more bold in telling others about Christ. In other words, that it's not only influenced non-believers, it's influenced believers. I'm handling this thing with joy, even though I'm in this terrible situation. And it, they've gained confidence and they've become more bold in sharing the good news of Jesus and the love of God with other people. Again, that's not what Paul had planned to do, but that's what God was using 
And in the process, he's affecting positively for Jesus everybody that's around him in his, in his struggles and in his difficulties. Now, the next thing I want to lift up here is he says, he's also teaching us, don't let others control my attitude. Now, it's really interesting what he says here in verse 15 and 17. You'll see it through 17, you'll see it there. It's true that some people preach Christ because they are jealous and quarrelsome. Others preach for, from genuine goodwill. These do so out of love, and they know God's given me the work of defending the gospel. Others preach Christ insincerely from a spirit of selfish ambition. Others want to stir up more trouble for me and add to my pain while I'm in prison. In other words, he says, here I'm in prison, and people are attacking my ministry. They're slandering, they're judging, they're criticizing and he says, but now wait a second. He says, there are some people that are supporting, he says, this ministry. And he's thankful for them and their brothers and sisters in the gospel. And that's great. Uh, but, you know, we've also got to deal with these other folks, too. Uh, and so let's take a look at that here. You, because what he's doing is he's describing four kinds of people. Uh, there are this, these persons that are supporters in there and these three killjoys. And I guess I would describe those three kind of killjoys as, first of all, there is critics. They're slandering Paul. They're creating all kind of controversy. His competitors, they're preaching Christ out of rivalry. And I guess I, I decided to call them uproar makers. Uproar makers, they, uh, Paul says, they just want to make more problems. They want to make my life worse. Uh, they want to kick me when I'm down. And so let's take a look at each of those. And how do you deal with those? Critics, how about that? You'll see that uh, he says again, it's true that some people preach Christ because they are jealous and quarrelsome. Now, that word that's translated quarrelsome, that's kind of an interesting word. Uh, eris is the Greek word, and it means people who love to argue, people who enjoy creating controversies, people who are contentious, people who are divisive, uh, people who like to, you know, get into the arguments, and they're wrangling, and they're, and then they're in this and that. Uh, he says, you know, that's the kind of people uh, that these guys are. Uh, and, you know, as I was thinking about what he was talking about, I was reminded of years ago when I was driving through New Mexico, and there was just kind of out in the middle of nowhere, and there wasn't many radio stations in that area. And I turned it on the AM radio, thinking maybe I'd get something. And I was switching it around, and I got into the dial there, and I got to this one Christian radio station, and there's this radio preacher on it. And I listened to this guy for about five minutes, and he attacked everybody and everything that moved. Uh, and I'm thinking, no, I don't think I need to listen to that, you know? Now, have you ever heard that, stuff like that? Have you ever seen stuff like that, maybe, maybe on a blog or maybe something, social media that somebody is posting? And it's interesting that he connects jealousy with quarrelsomeness, jealousy with this contentiousness and divisiveness in them, you know, looking to get into conflict. And, and that's, I never thought about that, but there is really a connection between I want something from you or of you, and the how I'm going to do it, I'm going to get into this quarrel. And look, few things can rob us of our joy faster than criticism. Is that not right? But there's a fact that we sometimes don't think about. Yes, there are the critics, but you and I don't need other people's approval to be joyful. We don't need other people's permission to be joyful. It is a choice that we make as we lift up our eyes to God. So, one way to really be miserable is to try to live for the approval of others. But there's a choice. I can choose joy as I focus on the Lord. Now, the next kind of, the next person, our next section would be, uh, uh, in this little passage would be his competitors. And he says, other people preach Christ and sincerely from a spirit of selfish ambition. He says, they look to God, but they're actually ego-driven. And how do you ID something like, somebody like that? How do you identify that person? How about this? Uh, they are putting down others all the time. And in the process, they're trying to build themselves up. If you see somebody that's putting other people down all the time, and in the process, they're trying to, you know, blow their own horn. They're trying to build themselves up. That's what he's talking about. That's a spirit of selfish ambition. Now, I just got to tell you, that is everywhere. That spirit is everywhere. That spirit is in business. <laughs> that spirit is in the way that we look at our lawns. I mean, oh, wait a second, my neighbor's lawn is greener than mine. Uh, you know, my neighbor's lawn's got less weeds than mine. Our, my, our cars, I was driving around in this Mustang Yukon area, and I was, kind of, I was just kind of amazed at how many, how many new 
Mercedes? How many new BMWs? How many new Teslas? How many, I had Lamborghini, uh, how many, I mean, that's an expensive car, you know, and all these expensive cars. I'm thinking, we're kind of competing in our cars, aren't we? How about comp- the spirit of uh, selfish ambition in, with respect to how we compete with our kids? I remember my sister years ago, uh, she had our, my niece, uh, Stacy and put her into a dance class, dance school, uh, and she said, you know, uh, that was one of the most backstabbing experiences I've ever had, a dance school, because their moms were competing with their kids, and, and you know, they would do kind of that stuff too. How many different ways does the, the spirit of selfish ambition get into our lives? Now, you know, how do you get out of that? You got to realize that that's going on around you, and you got to make a choice not to get caught up in that. You've got to make a choice not to be bothered by that because you're going to look for joy in another place of life other than that kind of stuff. Then finally, there are the uproar makers. And you see, he says this, other people just want to stir up more trouble for me. Uh, like he didn't have enough trouble, so they're, going to, they're out there. He's in prison, and they're out there, and they're stirring up trouble. And they, they want to add, he says, to my pain while I'm in prison. Uh, you know, uh, they want to rob you of your joy. Uh, and you, you certainly be robbed of your joy if you don't know how to deal with that kind of a person. Because what Paul is basically describing there is an emotional terrorist. I mean, he's in prison. Uh, and he's got enough problems to deal with right there. And there are people out there that they're, they're you know, running him down. They're gossiping about him. Uh, they're attacking him. And they're attacking his ministry. And it's kind of like, you know, you think, you read that, you think, well, who would want to do that? But sometimes we find up for makers in our lives. And and it's because, you know, I'm down and out, and these guys are trying to kick me. Now, it's interesting how Paul said, when he talks about his attitude towards that, and listen to what he writes. He says this, but he says, what others do doesn't really matter. The important thing is, in every way, whether for right or wrong reasons, the message of Christ is being shared. So, I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. He says, what I do is I focus on Jesus. I choose to rejoice in Jesus. I choose to have joy, and I will continue to have joy. And he says, I'm not going to let anybody steal my joy. And he says, okay, so I'm going to focus in on this. And he says, in my suffering, I'm going to focus on Jesus. And in the process, guess what? Something happens to him inside. Now, now listen to what he says here next. You'll see there, verse 28. Be fearless. He's, saying, he's writing this to the, the, the Christians, the Jesus followers there at Philippi. He says to them, be fearless. No matter who opposes you, it will be a sign to them of their downfall that God is with you and that he will save you. You know, as I was reading that particular passage, I was reminded of the book of Joshua. And Joshua, the first chapter, is really interesting because uh, you have Moses, who's been the, the leader of the Israelites for decades, and he was, you know, the greatest leader they, they've ever seen, and he was this lawgiver, and he spoke to God and face to face, you know, kind of just up in personal with God on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, Moses, who, who did miracle after miracle and was God's hand in leading them out of captivity in Egypt and leading them to the edge of the promised land, and they get to the edge of the promised land, and it says, Moses goes on the top of Mount Pisgah, and there on the top of this mount, uh, he dies, and, and we don't know what happened to his body. He was just taken somewhere uh, by God. Uh, and so guess what, Joshua? It's your time to lead. And boy, he's got big shoes to fill. And God comes to him and says, now, Joshua, here's the deal. You're going to lead, and you're going to lead the people into the promised land, and there's going to be wars that you're going to have with these peoples and these tribes and these nations that are in the promised land, and this is going to go on for years. Uh, and then he says, Moses, uh, he says, Moses is gone, but now, Joshua, what I want you to do is just be strong and be courageous. And he, he repeats this about five times, the Lord says. Joshua, be strong and be courageous. And then he finally says, I command you to be strong and be courageous. He says, don't worry about what's ahead of you. I'm with you. Now, that's Paul's attitude, and that's what he's sharing with these folks. Paul says this, basically saying, I've been through all this. I've had all these problems, and I'm just telling you, be fearless no matter what's opposing you. Be fearless. Why? Because who can contend with God? Who can overcome God? What what struggle or problem do we have in our lives that God can't handle? And so Paul is saying to these Jesus followers in Philippi, be fearless no matter what you're facing. Be strong and be courageous no matter what you're facing. Now, listen to what he says here in verse 28 through 30. 
For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ. Now, I don't know if we in our society can hear this very well. What he's saying here. Listen to this. For, we, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, you've also been given the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this, life, this fight together. You have seen me suffer for him in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of a great struggle. He says, guess what? It's a privilege to believe in Jesus. It's a privilege to have a relationship with him, but it's also a privilege to suffer with and for Jesus. And that actually makes us more like Jesus when we do that. And I think we're so into comfort in our own society, in our own culture, that it's kind of like, it's a privilege to suffer? It's a privilege to suffer for the Lord? Yeah. And so he's basically saying, I maintain my joy no matter what happens because I view my problems from God's point of view. I don't let what others say or do control my joy. Uh, and there's a third thing Paul says that's important to he underlines here in this particular situation. Uh, and you'll see that. He says, always trust God to work things out. In other words, I don't try and work things out on my own. I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to trust God to put things back together. And he said, basically, you got, you got a problem. you got two choices. You can choose to worship, or you can choose to worry. You can choose to pray, or you can choose to panic. It's up to you. Now listen to what he says here. I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and as the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, all that happened will turn out for my deliverance. In other words, he says, here's, the, here's some sources of strength for you. The first one is looking at this, just looking at what he says there. He's looking at his problems from a God's perspective, not a human perspective. And then he's talking about prayer. You're praying for me. You know, I don't know how many times in just in the last few weeks I've heard people ask for prayer and then say, to, you don't know what it meant to me to have people praying for me. You don't know what it meant to me to have people's fam, uh, people praying for my family member. Uh, and, you know, the importance of that, the significance of that, the power of that. And then Paul says, okay, so all there's something else. This is the Spirit of Jesus Christ is also helping me. And that's the way it is with you and me. The Spirit of Jesus is here to help us and strengthen us. And he says, in that situation, what I do is I expect to be delivered. God is going to provide some form of deliverance for me, and I'm trusting that I have faith in that. In other words, I'm going to trust God to work things out. Then finally, I'm going to stay focused on my purpose and not my problems. Now, Paul had a lot of problems. He was old. He was in prison. My suspicion is that wasn't the nicest of places to be. He was way far away from home. He was probably awaiting execution. And there, in most of, many of these letters that he writes, he says, you know, I'm, nobody's with me here right now. And my friends are gone. My freedom is gone. My privacy is gone. But, he says, they can't take away my purpose. They can take away all this other stuff. But they can't take away my purpose. You know, as I was thinking about that this week, I was reminded of... Uh, uh, Victor Frankel, who was a, uh, a, he, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankel was a Jewish psychiatrist who was captured by the Nazis in, in Europe in uh, World War II, and he was taken to a Nazi death camp, he and family members. Uh, and he says, one day he was, uh, they stripped them uh, naked, they had nothing, they had, they had no power, they had no privileges, they had no rights, they had nothing, and they were standing out, a line out there. And he says, as I was standing out there with nothing, I realized there was one thing that could not be taken away from me, and that was how I would respond to this situation. And Paul says, I'm going to focus on my purpose in this situation, and that is to serve God by serving other people in Jesus' name. Okay, so look at what he says in, in uh, verse 22 through 25. And this is, really, this is really kind of amazing stuff where he says, if I continue to live... Uh, I can do more worthwhile work for Christ. So I'm not sure what I should choose. I'm pulled in two directions here. I very much want to leave this life and be with Christ, which is far better. But for your sake, it's much more important that I remain alive so I know I must stay on with you all so that uh, I can add to your progress and your joy in faith. And there's, he says, I've got a purpose for living and I've got a purpose for dying too. He says, I can have a purpose for living and blessing you and helping you and serving you in Jesus' name. Uh, uh, but there's also a purpose in dying. I will be with Christ and it will be joy. You know, as I was reading that passage this week, I was reminded out of uh, years ago, there was a, a great saint of our church here uh, who is near death. 
And somebody asked this saint, says, so are, you, are you sad about all this? Uh, uh, you know, about what's going to happen here to you just a very short time. And uh, that person's response is, why should I be? I'm going to be with my Lord today. I have a purpose not only for living, I have a purpose for dying. I will be with my Lord today. And Paul says, I'm going to serve God by serving others in Jesus' name, and I'm going to focus on that as my purpose. Now, I, under, I understand what happens is many of us, we make ourselves miserable because we think joy comes from self-gratification. And we're, we're trained in this. We're propagandized in this over and over again. You know, your joy comes from possessions. Your joy comes from pleasure. Your joy comes from position. Your joy comes from sex. Your joy comes from salary. Your joy comes from status. And it's all about living for me. And I just want to tell you that the way to joy is so sacrifice, not self-gratification. And that's where we get to where Paul says this. He says, for, the, for me, in my joy, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And if you want to know your, your prospects for joy in this life, if you will just fill out this sentence, for me to live is, and whatever that is, it will tell you what your prospects for joy are. For me to live is, what would that be? So, as we conclude here, just some questions for you and I to think about. First is, have I been looking at my problems from a human perspective or from God's perspective? Yeah, have you been looking at your problems? Uh, second, am I letting others control my attitude? Because, you know, that got a lot of that, where a lot of times that's what's being attempted to happen. Or am I, how about this one, am I trusting God to work things out? Or am I trying, uh, it's all up to me. Or am I looking to him? And then finally, and this is really is critical. How would I feel out in this statement? For me to live is. What would you put in that blank? For me to live is blank. You know, the way that you answer that will really determine how much joy you'll have in your life. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your grace and goodness towards us. We give you thanks that you loved us and that you're with us, and help us to turn to joy. Help us to turn to you. Help us to lift up our eyes to you so that we might find that joy that Paul is calling us to, that joy in all circumstances, that joy that cannot be taken away from us, the joy that you offer us in Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Okay, we come to our time in the worship service here where we're going to be offering you online communion. If you'd like to take that, I want to invite you to get your elements ready now. Uh, and then we'll be back here in just a second uh, with the prayer for consecration. So go ahead and please prepare your elements. Okay, let's enter now into a prayer for a consecration for the elements that you have where you're at and also we have here. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness and grace towards us and how when nothing else existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and you said, let there be light and there was light. And you gave us life. You blessed us. You gave us so many blessings of creation and uh, you were there with us. And sometimes uh, we, we just went astray. But you sent your prophets and your apostles and your teachers in order to lead us and guide us. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only begotten son to give himself for us and to teach us the way of truth and life. We remember how on the night in which he was betrayed, as he sat there at the table there in the upper room with his disciples, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us wherever we might be this day and upon these gifts of the bread and the cup that we're about to receive. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. 
that we may be for the world the body of Christ that has been redeemed by His blood. By Your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you now to go ahead and receive communion. Now that we receive communion, I want to invite you to pray this prayer after communion with me. You'll see it there on your screen. Lord, you have given yourself to us. Now we give ourselves to others. You are our help and strength. Through your resurrection, we have become a people of hope. Amen. Just a couple of uh, important things for you to know before we leave. First of all, giving our offerings to the Lord is such a blessing and such a privilege. Uh, and uh, so I just want to encourage you to make sure and give a wor worship offering to the Lord this week at the Good Shepherd. You can do that online at UMCGS, or you can also mail in the check here to Good Shepherd at 10928 Southwest 15th here in Yukon, 73099. Uh, and I just want to also celebrate uh, that we've done our Shepherd's Journey offering uh, over the month of uh, this, no, almost the entire month month of September, uh, and so far we've received $28,845, so we're getting close to $30,000 on that offering, which I think is fantastic, uh, and I just want to celebrate everybody that's been a part of that, and you know, if you haven't contributed to that, that would be great if you would do that. Really, uh, you know, the church has just had so many kind of crazy and just unexpected ex expenses this year. Uh, if you could help out with just an above and beyond your regular gifts and offerings uh, to help out in that Good Shepherd's uh, journey offering, that would be great. I also want to just point out that, again, uh, we've gone to Mass Optional here at the church. Uh, that's for our worship services in person and other in-person events. And so just to, just to let you know about that one more time. And then I just want to tell you about something that's fun. On October the 10th at 10 a.m. Uh, here on our front lawn, uh, on Sunday, October the 10th, uh, there's going to be an ice cream social at 10 a.m. Uh, and the pe people that are going to be putting that on have entitled it, Chill Out, Ruin Your Lunch, and Have Fun. Uh, and so that's 10 a.m. on October the 10th, so 10, 10 at 10. Uh, and just remember that and make sure to be there at, uh, for that. Uh, and that may God, with that, may God bless you, encourage you, and fill you with his joy as you look up to him this week. Amen.